Welcome to Global Ethics Review. I'm Alex Woodson from Carnegie Council, the world's catalyst for ethical action. In this podcast series, we'll be connecting Carnegie Council's work and current events with our senior fellows, senior staff, and friends of our organization. You'll hear from leading experts on artificial intelligence and technology, migration, climate change governance, and U.S. foreign policy and global engagement. Last week, in part one of our look at the COVID-19 pandemic and its effect on international relations, I spoke with Carnegie Council President Joel Rosenthal and Senior Fellow Nicholas Kvostev. We discussed cooperation versus competition, the status of China, and some other broad topics. In this episode, we'll focus largely on the United States. You'll hear more clips from some Spring 2020 Carnegie Council podcasts and the rest of my interviews with Rosenthal and Gvozdev. This first clip is from a podcast recorded in mid-May 2020. Gvozdev and I spoke with Damian Kurnevich Miskovich, Director of Policy Research and Publications at Azerbaijan's ADA University. We discussed the question of leadership in the pandemic and what comes after. Moving forward, the question is, is well, what sort of leaders are we looking for? Uh, what sort of leaders can emerge that uh, will have trust, both from their populations and then can become or be seen as global leaders? And what's interesting is that, you know, people often say, well, the leader of the free world is, you know, Chancellor Angela Merkel. Uh, that Germany really is, has to pick up some of this. Uh, but of course, you know, Germany's response during the COVID crisis in terms of European solidarity wasn't, uh, wasn't particularly as uh, exemplary. Uh, and she's also a leader, a lame duck. She's on, on her way out. And you know, who replaces her at the heart of Europe is not clear. People sometimes say, well, what about uh, Emmanuel Macron? Uh, is he a figure that can, that can move forward? Except uh, his problem is uh, he is not immune from the populist wave inside of France. He is not, uh, you know, he still largely uh, is a political figure on the force of his own personality rather than, you know, a really strong, dedicated party movement. Uh, and he could be uh, swept away uh, at some point due in elections. Uh, and then the question is, is, does the democratic system produce the types of leaders now uh, that are going to be willing uh, to gain trust, but also push back against against uh, the populist wave. And that I think is an open question, even within the American context. Um, you know, people will say, well, you know, uh, President Joe Biden will be, you know, likely to do things differently, except his rhetoric on China. Uh, he's trying in some ways to out Trump Trump on China. Uh, he's making some of the same appeals about competition and decoupling and uh, China's a threat uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and the problem that even if we have an electoral change here, and I think Damian has already alluded to this, uh, is that once, once other countries have seen that a significant part of the United States electorate and political system is willing to turn its back on allies, willing to turn its back on institutions, um, even if uh, Joe Biden says, look, we're coming back, we're restoring, uh, you've, you've, you've set the precedent and you've set the, uh, the idea that the United States has done this once, it can do it again, and therefore, you know, will Europeans and others say, well, we now have to hedge. We have to hedge against the United States. We have to keep ties open to China. We have to keep ties open to Russia. We have to uh, be prepared that the United States is not going to exercise leadership at some point in the future. Uh, does this mean Europe has to consolidate more uh, within itself? Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of things are left. Uh, I think are, are left uh, undecided. And again, this idea that somehow one election in the United States in November of 2020 is going to magically change all of these trends uh, and return us to 2016 or 2008 or 2000 or 1992. Uh, and everything is going to be fine, and, and, and we're going to move forward, I think, is, uh, is wishful thinking. Uh, Dami, you wanted to add to that? Sure. Yeah, I want to jump in about Emmanuel Macron. He gave, there, there are parts of, of his, I mean, he, France may or may not be a great power, and, and, but there are a number of, of indications that, uh, that Macron at least has some populist tendencies. Uh, on the other hand, he, he gave an interview to the FT a couple recently, and he said something that I thought was quite, um, quite thoughtful, actually. 
um, he talked about, he quoted Adam Smith. He talked about economics as a moral science, right? And that's, that's something that you, there aren't that many leaders, whether they're populists or not, that can make that argument. He went on and talked about how, but the, the, the point was that, that Europe is first a political project and, and an economic project second. Um, and because it's a political project first, it, it's, um, it's based in, it's, it, there's, a, there's a fundamental notion of solidarity. And then the economic argument comes, uh, is derivative from, from the political argument. In that context, he talked about a moral science, um, economics being an, a moral science. But, you know, the problem is that economics may be a moral science, but economics is at the end of the day about having the resources that you need to do the stuff that you want to do and uh, both internally and 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 beyond your own borders and uh and the the money that's being spent just to serve as a bridge now just to to, to prevent fundamental economic collapse dark ages economic collapse is is unprecedented and so you're going to have to keep spending more money for the recovery. And when you think about what that means in terms of the conduct of foreign policy, given that we have great power populism, it's unclear that you're going to follow the logical move, which is to de-escalate, right? If, you're, if you don't have enough resources at your disposal and you've got all this stuff happening in the world from Syria to Libya to Afghanistan, you name it, right? climate change, sustainable development, all these things, some of which require significant multilateral cooperation uh, and probably even heightened multilateral cooperation, which isn't happening. Um, so the question is, are, is, is are, are leaders in the world going to come together and say, okay, let's, you know, we have our, our differences and we're not suggesting that we should solve them, but let's just put them on pause for a while while we recover our economies. That would be the logical thing to do. Um, and it would probably be the moral thing to do and the ethical thing to do. But it's unlikely that that's going to happen. When COVID goes away or when it's brought under control, all of this other stuff that nobody's talking about because they're focusing on, on, on death uh, in the context of, of their domestic situations because of, of the pandemic, all of these conflicts are still there. They're still unresolved. There's still not enough cooperation. Um, there's no leadership. And so you're going to have, it seems to me, a situation in the months ahead where uh, the, the, the potential for the, for the, for the harnessing of, of additional resources, whether they're military or economic or whatever, uh, is going to decrease significantly. And yet the belligerents and the rivalries are still going to be there. And that's going to create significantly more or greater potential for instability and for really sort of, I don't know how else to put it, completely random events mm. uh, and, and a level of unpredictability that, is, that, that no one has seen for a long time. With President Biden now in office, I talked with Gavozdev and Rosenthal about what exactly has changed and how the U.S. and its allies can move forward. Here's Joel Rosenthal. I do think President Biden has done a good job, um, you know, reestablishing the um, the role of the United States in, um, if not leading, certainly being, you know, what used to be called the first among equals in the uh, in the global community of playing our role, uh, which as the second largest economy in the world is a considerable role. Uh, and um, since World War II, a historic role in helping to forge, you know, collective action to meet collective threats. And uh, he has to thread the needle right now in that he can't just say, uh, you know, um, uh, America is the leader, you know, we're back in a sense and expect everybody to fall in line. On the other hand, um, he needs to um, uh, show in a real way uh, that we are, um, you know, well-intentioned in terms of uh, forging alliances to meet collective threats. So the obvious thing is the uh, the climate agreement, the Paris Agreement, rejoining, 
uh, the signal of wanting to uh, rejoin the um, Iran deal and, and so on. So um, I think that um, given the fact that we're two months in, you know, signals have been sent, words have been said, some actions have been taken. And, um, you know, it's trying to, um, I think, project a, a, a strong sense of direction, uh, a sense of clarity, a sense of purpose, but also a sense of humility. So uh, two months in, I think that um, it's where I would have hoped it would be. Do you, do you think something like like the 1.9, I believe it's $1.9 trillion uh, stimulus deal, do other countries look at that and say, okay, this America's getting serious now. This is, I, I know we passed deals when, when Trump was in office as well, but do the allies look at something like the, like the stimulus deal and, and are, they, are they hardened by that? Do they, do they see that and, and think America's back on the right track or is that just something for, for America internal politics to, to think about? It's a great question. I, I think that um, as the rest of the world looks at America right now, my guess is, uh, and this is just a guess, what they're seeing is uh, first and foremost, the development and the distribution of the vaccines um, happening at a very rapid pace. And uh, it seems to me what's happened is we got off to a slow start in the sense of, um, you know, there was, and then we continue to have some issues with the distribution, but we seem to be getting over those quite rapidly. Uh, and within the next few weeks, within certainly within the next two months, uh, we will be way ahead of the rest of the world in terms of the availability of a vaccine and the ability to distribute it to the American people. And it's sort of reminiscent of World War II, I suppose, where the United States got off to a very slow start, um, had some trouble getting going, but once it got going, um, had the means of production and the will uh, and the ability to, to produce. Um, and um, so I think that, that that does speak well of the United States in the sense of, of its ability to, to, to react, to respond um, in ways that, um, again, they may not have the efficiency of a centrally controlled government like China. On the other hand, in the longer run, um, is, is, you know, makes, makes more people better off uh, in that sense. So my guess is that um, the United States, this will, be, this will reflect well on the United States. Um, in terms of the, um, the stimulus plan, uh, boy, there's just a lot of questions about that, but I think there's every reason to be at this point somewhat optimistic that it will provide a, a good bridge from uh, the pandemic economy to the post-pandemic economy, and then we're into, into a new era. Certainly there's a honeymoon period, uh, I think. And even among countries that have uh, adversarial relations with the United States, there is a welcomeness as to the predictability and professionalism of the Biden administration. And this is, for example, something that you'll hear uh, from Moscow, uh, where there is no illusion that uh, US-Russia relations are anywhere uh, in any type of optimal situation, but at least you're dealing with an administration which uh, doesn't have mixed messaging uh, or where you're rushing to uh, you, you're talking to a U.S. official and uh, then you're checking Twitter to see if that uh, position has been contradicted or changed and maybe the position has been changed again. Uh, so there's a predictability from the Biden administration, I think, that, that countries welcome. Uh, in theory, what the Biden administration is proposing uh, it should be attractive to a number of friends and partners uh, in terms of working together, uh, strengthening uh, cooperation, strengthening supply chains, working together in uh, areas of technology and energy uh, and climate change and health security, uh, with an eye that these can also be drivers for domestic uh, economic growth uh, in both the United States and in partner countries. Uh, all of that is very ambitious. It's a good vision that he is laying out. Uh, he is incorporating 
uh, some of the themes that we identified in the uh, Carnegie Council reports on global engagement, uh, where he is uh, at least explicitly saying he's not, it's not turning the clock back. He's looking forward for cooperation, but cooperation with an eye to regenerating uh, America's institutions and regenerating its economy, uh, regenerating its position of leadership, uh, shifting more with using climate uh, as a way to, to try to build these ties and even to navigate with countries with whom we are likely to have adversarial relations, such as China, where there are common interests uh, around climate and energy, uh, which could uh, help to mitigate uh, competition between uh, Beijing and Washington. So the early months, it's all there. The, the, of course, the proof is in the pudding. Um, how does this get mediated in terms of the bureaucracy? How does it get mediated in terms of what Congress chooses to support or not to support? Uh, I think other countries will look at what has happened with the COVID relief bill and perhaps think that a president who made an opening bid uh, 1.9 was his opening bid and got 1.9 through Congress suggests that perhaps uh, he will be able to uh, navigate through the legislative thicket and be able to get some of these uh, some of these things through. On the other hand, we already have a few uh, storm clouds on the horizon. Um, our European partners do not see eye to eye with, with us on China. Uh, Germany does not see eye to eye with us on Russia policy. Uh, we have an unsettled situation in the Middle East uh, with regard to uh, Iran, uh, with regard to changing our relationship with Saudi Arabia. So, you know, we'll see how this plays out uh, over the long run. The other thing, too, and let me, I'll, I'll just end on this last point, is that the Biden administration, in its first major public statement about foreign affairs, uh, paid close attention to Africa and to Latin America beyond sort of the perfunctory phrases that we're used to hearing uh, in, in US national security declarations. But again, uh, having said it, the question will be, is there really going to be more of an engagement with the global South uh, under the Biden administration than previously, certainly under the last administration, but really also in the Obama and Bush and Clinton years as well. Um, so that, that I think is a, a question for us to keep an eye on and perhaps revisit in a year's time. Do you get the sense that um, our allies, um, United States allies, Western Europe, maybe Latin America, Africa, some of these countries that, that you mentioned, are they still looking uh, at, to, to the United States to be a leader or, or have they, you know, one thing that, that you've talked about in some of the clips I sent along was that after four years of Trump, uh, can can the United States be be trusted anymore? Is is we you know we can't go back to 2016. So, um, are what are the expectations for that are that the Allies have of the United States right now with, with the Biden administration in place? I think that I think you hit the nail on the head that our allies and partners around the world uh, are are a little leery now. They've seen that the United States can wobble. They've seen that the United States can turn inward, that the United States can become a lot more nakedly transactional in foreign policy. Uh, and that is worrying um, to countries that were used to the idea of a United States that offered alliance and partnership on relatively easy terms. On the other hand, uh, they're also aware that they can no longer uh, ignore U.S. domestic politics as a factor in foreign policy, and that to the extent that there is economic anxiety inside the United States, uh, that will play a role in the future. And I think that the, the way that the Biden uh, team has been very upfront about that uh, should be reassuring in the sense that it is it's straight talk. Look, I think most countries, given a choice, uh, would prefer to have a relationship with the United States. That doesn't mean that they're going to give the United States a blank check. Uh, again, going back to our relationship with Germany, it's very clear uh, that even though she's wrapping up her term in office, Angela Merkel is making it clear that she is not offering a blank check. That leadership does not mean that the United States uh, leads and everyone blindly follows, that there's going to be negotiations. I think that partners are going to hedge a bit against the United States, uh, uh, looking at our own domestic politics. Uh, 
you know, it's unclear what will happen in midterm elections in 2022 uh, or what could happen in presidential elections in 2024. So uh, I think you're going, other countries will want to have partnership relations with the US, but they're gonna wanna hedge. They're gonna wanna have some backups in case something happens again. Uh, and again, there's an ethical component to this, which I think is important. It's not just naked realpolitik uh, or amoral transactionalism at work. It has to do, again, back with this question of who is owed what? And why is someone owed something? And I think that for a number of years, and this comes out of the, the experience of the 1990s, the United States uh, could afford to act on the world stage uh, in a way that other partners assumed that the United States would be happy writing what were relatively blank checks uh, and got used to that and did not necessarily feel that burden sharing or other such things was, was an absolute necessity. So people always paid lip service to it. Yes, we should do more. But if the United States was willing to, 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 to pay the bills, uh, you did not have other countries necessarily rushing to, to grab the check. And I think now there's a realization that even with a Biden administration, if, if you like, if you're a country that likes what the Biden administration is doing, you may feel that you need to uh, be a bit more proactive and sometimes uh, reaching for the check, uh, so to speak, the metaphorical check uh, in order to bolster the Biden position so that uh, in 2024, this type of internationalism that the Biden team exemplifies does not run up against a, a narrative challenge uh, from a challenger saying, uh, why aren't you taking care of your own, right? Why are Americans paying bills for others and uh, Americans perhaps are, are in need. So I think that you're going to see that moving forward. Finally, to look at the big picture, it's hard to grasp how historic this last year has been. With over half a million deaths, the U.S. has endured a catastrophe, and it's been changed forever. Our last day at the Carnegie Council office in New York was March 12, 2020. It was the day after Trump issued a haphazard European travel ban, and the NBA shut down due to a player testing positive for COVID-19. Those two events made it clear that the next weeks, and possibly months and years, would be very different. When Mayor Bill de Blasio declared a state of emergency for New York City on March 12th, Carnegie Council decided it was time to work from home. A year later, I've been to the office once, something I never imagined. The week after we closed our office, Kavozov and I discussed this new world on a podcast. I asked him if there was any episode in history that compares with our current situation. Not to, to, to overblow it, but uh, really to look at what we were experiencing a century ago in the, in the aftermath of World War I. Uh, obviously, there was a pandemic that occurred at the end of the war, the Spanish influenza outbreak, but also the idea that within a few short years, because of the impact of World War I and of all of these changes, how much the world shifted. There's an excellent book uh, that I have just finished reading called uh, The Crucible. And it looks at this period from the end of 1917 to 1924 and to realize the amount of change that had occurred uh, in the world, uh, changes in governments, changes in, in international order, changes in domestic societies, the technological change that was you know, the, the birth of mass communications in, in, in the early 1920s, the, the emergence of revolutionary movements on both the right and the left, uh, the fact that all of these pillars of society that in 1913 appeared to be so unshakable 10 years later have all, uh, this, you know, the landmarks have changed in some cases beyond recognition. And I, I think we are, I think that, you know, it's interesting, one of the things I had been telling my students in 2019 was I felt that we were on the verge of, a, of another shift, that in 1989, 30 years before, we'd had the fall of the Berlin Wall, and look at all of the change that that uh, brought in. That you, you started 1989 thinking the world was one way, and then you looked at, um, by the end of 1989, the, the world looked very different. And I think that, you know, we are moving into something where, 
2019, 2020, the world looked one way, and you know, later on by this year, uh, it may looked it may look at something um, very different. One year later, Kavozdev and I reflected on this podcast. Just to wrap up, um, I just wanted to bring it back to uh, the first podcast that we did um, after the pandemic hit hit New York, and we started working from home uh, from our, from our New York office. Um, it was a very different world then. We were we weren't using Zoom. We weren't wearing masks. Um, it was just this March twenty twenty was just you know it's it's going to be a a time that we all have a lot of different thoughts and feelings about for the rest of our lives. Um, but it was it was really interesting that you you saw this very clearly at at the time. I asked you what what what's what's a historical comparison you can make, and you said nineteen nineteen Spanish flu, end of World War One, huge changes in in the in the world order um, a year later, what do you think of that comparison? Does, it, does that still hold for you? I think it does. Uh, I think that we will speak of an era ending and a new era starting. And whether we use the 320, uh, I, and it, partly it's because for, for different people, there's a different date in February or March when it really hit home. Uh, for me, it happened to be March 13th because that's when I had a, that's when I began to have the cascade of can cancellations of what people thought might just be postponements uh, for things which have turned out never to never to uh, to be rescheduled, and then it was don't come in. But you know, some let, let's assume that the shorthand is 320, right? So we went from 911 to 320. That that was one, that that was an era. Yes, we are moving into uh, a newer period uh, where institutions are being reshaped. Uh, the likelihood that, let's say we are doing this five years from now, we, we let's reconvene in 2026. Uh, my guess is we're going to have uh, throughout the world, uh, even potentially in Russia and China, uh, certainly in Western Europe and in Africa and in Latin America, and perhaps in the United States as well, almost certainly in the United States as well, a whole cadre of new faces in government, in politics, uh, perhaps in business, uh, we could be on the cusp of some very major changes in how we obtain energy, how our vehicles are being powered, uh, the, whether or not we see the use of, of climate and energy funds as perhaps stimulus spending, but does that create uh, new industries? And again, we, we'd be looking, again, we think of the, after the Spanish flu and after 1919 and the technological shift that the radio and uh, automobiles brought first to the United States and then and then around the world, uh, so that people lived very differently in 1926 than they were living in 1918 or 1917. Uh, I think we're on. The, I still uh, believe that we're we're going to look back the same way. Uh, that uh, we will adapt to certain new normals, just as we did after 9/11. But you know, air travel uh, has a very clear before and after uh, for anyone who remembers flying pre-9-11, uh, uh, you have very clear uh, dividing lines in your mind as to a before and after period. And the same thing here, uh, how, we, how we work, how we uh, congregate, uh, whether or not uh, what we, you know, where, where people choose to live, uh, all of those things are, are in flux now. Uh, and we've had this situation long enough for new normals to perhaps begin to develop and uh, that will lead to changes. And then it lead, if those changes in turn, bringing it back to what we do as ethics and international affairs, uh, those and not, to, not to, to put too much of a Marxist spin on it, but you know, as we change our economic way of living and our way of producing value uh, of necessity, our political institutions shift to take that into account, uh, our sense of obligations change, uh, our sense of what we owe and what we're owed, and our sense of how we connect to other people. Uh, the, the pandemic has done wonders, for instance, uh, in uh, really disrupting uh, geographic proximity as a basis for community and replacing it with uh, virtual proximity. Uh, and that has implications. Uh, if you are now having people regularly uh, communicating uh, in a meaningful fashion without having to be geographically proximate, without me and you having to sit in the same uh, same physical space in order to have this conversation. Uh, and you take that a thousand times 
a million times those you change those connectivities, you're going to reorder the community. And as you reorder the community, the ethics of the community are reordered, the politics of the community are reordered, and you end up with something different. Finally, here's Joel Rosenthal with his take on comparisons to 1919 and some more thoughts on President Biden. Well, when I think of 1919, I think beyond just the Spanish flu and the pandemic now, I'm thinking more about the, um, the end of World War I. And um, the, uh, so from an international relations point of view, this was the uh, sort of high mark of Wilsonianism and the idea of the creation of a League of Nations. And this was not evolutionary, but really revolutionary at the time, the idea of international law and organization becoming formalized at this time. And, and you know, Wilson, you know, taking a hard run at that and then not really making it. Um, so when I compare the, the time frames, um, what's interesting to me is that I don't see an analog to Wilson right now. There isn't a really strong internationalist institutionalist response to the pandemic, right? It's, it's, it's not, it's, we're, we're sort of devolving into vaccine nationalism and, and sort of increasing fragmentation as far as I can tell. So in that sense, 1919 was, was different. Um, and there was, there was that, that, that impulse to, to, to reorganize in a sense. Uh, but some of the similarities are, are there uh, and you see it in the, in the, the, the politics. Um, you know, there, are, there is really a, a sort of, there is a reaction, right? There are sort of reactionary elements uh, in our society. And you do get the feeling that as we move out of the pandemic, that we're going to see radical changes in radical changes in work, radical changes in society. You know, we're seeing this in the social unrest we see over the um, issues of race and class, and um, you know, um, uh, whether it was the social unrest of the uh, in the wake of the George Floyd murder uh, last year in 2020, uh, and we just see it in various elements of of work of um, home life, of society, of culture. And I think 1919 also had that, that element to it, that it was a, a moment of, um, of change, uh, politically, socially, economically. And um, I do feel, it, there's that feeling we're living through something like that now. Yeah, um, and it's just interesting to, to bring up Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson and to think about Joe Biden and not much of a comparison there. And uh, just thinking about Joe Biden as a president and um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's been, um, it's, it's just been such, such a change from, from Donald Trump to just have this, this man in the office who just has his head down and is just doing the work. And whether you like him or not, I, I think that's what's really needed right now. But at the same time, we don't really have a sense of what kind of president he's going to be. Um, There's just, um, just, just, just an interesting thought. Yeah, I think that um, what the president has told us is that um, what's important to him is unity in this country. And so he comes in at a very, you know, polarized moment. And so, you know, I think that he's his one of his organizing principles is to, you know, move ahead the agenda that he believes in and that the party believes in, but that he's really is seeking to unify uh, the country. Um, so that I think is a cardinal kind of virtue for him and the kind of presidency he wants to have. And then the other was, um, this may be a little bit high-minded, but um, you know, he said he wanted to restore the soul of America. Uh, and so let's see uh, what, he, what he means by that. Um, I think what he means is, you know, uh, a certain kind of sense of, of decency, of empathy, um, of solidarity, if you will. I don't know. This needs to be, be filled in. Um, but again, I think that this was his, um, um, you know, his signature in terms of the kind of president he wants to be. And then when we, we look in terms of international relations, again, as you say, 
Um, you know, no Woodrow Wilson, on the other hand, you know, his moment is different. And um, let's see, you know, let's see uh, what he's able to muster in terms of the, uh, the use of um, American power, um, you know, uh, uh, in terms of organizing, um, uh, sort of reorganizing alliances, perhaps organizing new alliances to meet collective threats. Uh, and that really does seem to be the moment that we're in and the collective threats are not really hard to imagine because they're right here with us. Pandemic being uh, probably uh, the first, climate um, maybe 1A, and then issues like the migration crisis and some other political issues that are quite urgent. And um, again, open question, we'll see. But I, I do think that in terms of intent, that President Biden has made his intentions clear. And um, he's certainly formed a administration that is consistent with that. You know, other presidents have been more ecumenical, if you will, and sort of, you know, team of rivals and such and putting together cabinets and, you know, uh, leadership groups that are quite, you know, different or represent different views. I think that, that President Biden has been very consistent in his appointments, in his direction. So uh, I think that um, my own view is that he's been very clear in intent. We'll see how he performs. Thanks to our guests, Nicholas Kavosev and Joel Rosenthal. For more, please go to CarnegieCouncil.org or follow us on Twitter at Carnegie Council. Thanks for listening and stay safe and healthy.